video is going to show how we can begin making a geologic model from the drill hole data. We're going to start with a little bit of grid preparation. One of the first things we're going to do is check out some of our global settings, which can really have a big impact on our modeling behavior. We're going to define a boundary for the model area, and then we're going to do the calculate residuals command. So that's going to kind of help guide us on what modeling method we might want to use when making the grids. In the next video, we'll actually make the grid files. So the first thing that we're going to do is check out our mining settings. I'm going to go to my settings pull down menu. I'm going to go down to Carlson configure. And you might want to bring up the help manual for this section. Uh, there's a lot of good explanations for the settings in here. But I'm going to jump into my mining settings. And I am going to bring my help manual over just to show a couple of the graphics. Again, there's a lot of settings in here, a lot of explanations. We won't go through every one, but you can check these out at your leisure. So the reason it's so important to review your mining settings is because these can have a very significant impact on the way that your geology is modeled. Uh, if you're not familiar with some of these settings, you can see some wild results if they're not used properly. So I'm going to touch on the major ones that I think anyone should inspect when starting on a brand new project. One of the first things that I do on a new project is I take a look at this seam stack and conformance setting and I like to make sure that that is turned off. Now just so you have an idea of what our conformance and seam stacking refers to, I'm going to scroll down in our help manual. I'm going to find this graphic that shows how conformance works. And essentially what conformance does is it artificially inserts data into a drill hole when a strata layer is not present. So using our graphic here, drill hole number one has the red, the blue, and the green strata, whereas drill hole number three only has the green strata. So if I only try to model that red strata layer and I turn off this conformance option, it's going to model totally flat. Maybe what I want, may not. But if I want the red strata to behave like the green strata, I can turn on the conformance option. And so what that'll do is it'll analyze drill hole number one, and it's going to put a artificial data point for the red and the blue strata above drill hole number three. So we can make one strata layer conform to another strata layer. Now on a first pass, I always turn that off because modeling the geology is often an iterative analysis and on my first pass I want to just see how things connect up using the data that is explicitly there. So I actually do like to start with modeling perfectly flat strata if there's only one data point and then I can come back and turn these options on. So my recommendation is to set this option to none on the first pass, but you very well may come back and change this. The next few options refer to strata pinch out. I do like to turn this option on because if we turn that option off, we can get some undesirable results. So using this graphic in the help manual, you can see drill hole number two doesn't have the blue strata or the green strata. If I turn off the pinch out option and model the strata, the blue strata will get modeled straight through drill hole number two. Because it doesn't see a blue data point in there, it totally ignores that hole when modeling the blue strata. So it carries through that drill hole and suddenly we end up with blue strata where it clearly wasn't existing. So by turning on the pinch out option, I can make this blue strata either narrow down to nothing right at that drill hole location or if I do a little more grid manipulation I can actually make it pinch out about halfway between. So my suggestion for a brand new project turn on calculate strata pinch out and also pinch out zero thickness. 
So whether the blue strata was listed in here with a zero value or if it was completely missing, those options will force a behavior similar to this. Jumping down, uh, the strata limit lines, I always like to turn these on and auto select them. So if a strata limit line is used, uh, it'll automatically get picked up. I'm gonna talk more about what a strata limit line actually is in a later video, and I'll get more in depth with some of these other options as well. The next two things I like to check for is to ensure that process only strata with beds and process only strata with definition are both turned off. If either of these options are turned on, it can actually ignore some of the data in my drill holes, which is not what I want to do. So I always make sure those are unchecked when I'm starting a new project. Another thing that I'll take a look at is my hole dip angle direction. So this essentially controls what the definition of a zero degree dip in the drill hole actually refers to. Most of the time I just leave this where a zero degree dip is straight down, 90 degrees is horizontal, 180 degrees is straight up. Now if you don't have drill hole dip angles imported, it's not going to matter what you have this set to. But that can have a very significant impact on the way your geology is modeled. The last thing that I check on the new projects is just what my key material name is set to. So for example, if I was working on a coal project, I might want to change this to be coal. And all that does is change some of the reports that we kick out so we can refer to coal tonnage as opposed to just generic key tonnage. My purpose is I like setting this to key, so it applies to any project, but of course you can change that as needed. So again, these are just some of the suggested settings for a new project. These may not be applicable to your project, but just on an initial pass, it's uh, very important that you at least review these settings to ensure that your model is going to come out the way you want it to. And again, I am going to discuss more of these settings a little more thoroughly in a later video. So once we've checked our mining settings, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to just define a working area for my model. So we can see I've got this whole area here covered by topo information. I'm going to want to model at least all of that area. And I always recommend modeling a little bit larger than what you think you might need. For example, if I modeled just the area immediately around these drill holes very close in, and then something changed in my project, maybe I acquired a new piece of property, um, maybe some of my designs were going to take up a little more room than I originally estimated, it's always easier to trim a project down rather than increase the size of it and have to go back through all the steps. So with that in mind, when I talk about defining a boundary for the project, because many models in Carlson are just going to be a series of grid files, I'm going to pick a rectangular bound that fully encloses this entire area. Now, what you can do to get an idea of that is you can just go into your, actually let's go to our layer manager and let's make a new boundary layer. So I'm going to call this boundary-grid, or you can say boundary for the property, or boundary for the model. I'm going to set that to be current, and I'm going to set that just to be a, let's pick a red line here. And now I'm just going to draw a rectangle. And the first time I do this, I actually just try to pick a point, just kind of by eyeballing it, that fully encloses that area. Now, I don't like sticking with just randomly picked points because when I make a grid, I'm going to have to specify a cell size or a resolution. And right now, this vertex is it just a, it's not at a rounded off coordinate. So if you look down here at the current coordinates, that x coordinate is at 1645485. Four, 
Now, if I'm using a grid cell size of an exact 50 foot, then it's often just beneficial to round these coordinates off to an exact 50 foot increment. Same thing for the Y coordinates for both the bottom left and the top right. So what I like to do is I put my cursor here, I just inspect these numbers and then I round them off to a little cleaner numbers. So I've already done this where I drew a rectangle, I picked, found what those coordinates were, I just wrote them down and then I just rounded them off to a little cleaner coordinates. Once I know where my boundary is going to go, I'm actually going to delete that line. I'm going to bring my numbers off to the side here. I'm going to draw that rectangle again, but instead of just picking a point, I'm going to enter in these XY values. So my bottom left corner, I'm going to punch in the coordinates. And we can see where that first line goes, or that first vertex goes. And then I'll enter in the second coordinate. There we go. So you can see that rectangle, it's pretty tight around my model, but it does at least cover all the data that I have. Again, that's kind of a nitpicky thing to do to round off the coordinates like that. Uh, but it just makes numbers come out a little more cleanly. Okay, so I have now defined the boundary for my model. So my geology model is going to cover this entire rectangle. And again, if that's uh, too large, we can always cut it down very easily later on. But I do recommend going a little bit larger than what you think you need. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to this calculate residuals command. And what this command seeks to do is we're going to try to determine what the best interpolation method is to use for our data. Now the way that we do that, I want to show just a little graphic here for how this command actually works. So again, the whole goal is to determine how accurate a modeling method is for our data set. So how well does it fit our data? The way this command works is we're going to consider some attribute. So maybe I was looking at an elevation. This is a different data set shown here, but for this MM strata, I'm looking at some bottom elevations, so 409, 438. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by removing one of the data points, just totally throw it out of the model, and we're going to use the remaining data points to predict a model value at that location. We're going to compare our predicted value with the known value. And the difference between those two numbers is the residual. So if we repeat that process for all of the data points, we can come up with a average residual that's going to tell us how well does that modeling method match this data. So we've got quite a few different modeling methods. We could set this up to check multiple ones. And the one that gives us the lowest residual, that is the one that does the best job at guessing the value, that's going to be a strong candidate for us to move forward with for modeling our geology. So I just want to quickly show how that works for some of the modeling methods. For this one, we're going to go into the StratiCalc pull-down. I'm actually going to go down to Auto Run Residuals. The Calculate Residuals command only checks one modeling method at a time, but if I want to compare multiple modeling methods, I'm going to do Auto Run Residuals. I'm going to pick my drill holes, and I'm going to clear out any of the results that I have here, just if it's remembered anything from the last time I ran this command. And I'm going to start adding one row for each modeling method I want to consider. So I'm going to click Add. I'm going to pick a strata to process. So what strata do I want to use as my test case for this? So I'll click Choose Strata to Process. I'm going to pick my C1 strata and I'm going to check out the thickness. 
I want to determine what's the best modeling method for modeling thickness. So I'll click that, and you can see I've got all these different modeling methods to pick from, and every one is going to give a slightly or maybe a significantly different answer from the other. So, for example, triangulation is going to do a direct connection of data points. Inverse distance is going to do a weighted average of data points. Krieging is going to be a weighted average of data points, but it's also going to account for trending in the data. Uh, so we've got a lot of different methods to choose from. In this example, I'm just going to pick a few of them. So I'm going to go with the inverse distance method first. I've got other settings pertaining to that modeling method I could change, but I'll stick with the defaults. I'm going to add one more. And for this one, we're going to check out the polynomial method. You know, I have to choose the strata to process, make sure I'm using C1 thickness. And I'll add one more. And this time I'm going to again choose strata to process. C1 thickness, and this time I'm going to do the linear least squares method. So I could create one row for every modeling method and even some different variations on that, but I'm just going to check out these three for right now. To inspect it, I'm going to calculate the residuals. It's asking if I want to save these settings. I'm going to say no for right now. It takes me to my report formatter. And I'm going to inspect just a few things here. I want to see the strata and the value that was checked. I want to see the modeling method. And then this absolute value residual average. I'm just going to come down here and hit display. And I can see that I've got some different numbers for each of the different methods. Essentially what this is boiling down to is that on average, the inverse distance method is going to guess the thickness within 0.3 feet. The polynomial method, it's going to guess the thickness within 0.6 feet, and the linear least squares method is going to guess within 0.69 feet. Not a tremendous amount of variation, um, but these numbers are going to drastically differ based on your data. This should not be used to say that the inverse distance method is the absolute best modeling method for thickness across all projects and across all data sets. That's not what this is for. This is used specifically for this project. So you may find that when you calculate your residuals, one of the other methods may come out as a better candidate. Now, this is also not a hard and fast rule that says you should absolutely use inverse distance on this project. It is simply a measure to help reinforce your interpretation of what the best modeling method is. I still recommend that you check out the other modeling methods. You might actually build a quick model using them just to see how they come out. You can check cross sections. You can check contours. You can manually inspect the grids for any strange behavior. But this is just a guide that says, hey, you might want to try using this method. For the sake of simplicity for the rest of these videos, I am going to move forward only using the inverse distance method. But in an actual project, you're going to want to go a little more in depth to ensure that's a strong modeling method. So in conclusion there, calculate residuals just helps us determine which one of these modeling methods might we want to consider. I've got my answer, and in the next video I'm going to show how we actually build up a model using this modeling method.